Buongiorno. How is everybody this morning? All right, good. This is a picture of a tattoo. It's on my neck. It's right here. Can everyone see what it is? Any guesses? At first, thank you. <laughs> At first glance, it looks a little bit like a bird. A lot of people guess that it's a phoenix bird. Uh, but if you look at the negative space, you can see very clearly that it's actually a question mark. Now, why on earth would I tattoo a question mark on my neck? Am I some sort of social outcast? Some sort of high school rebel still clinging to my punk rock ideal that we should question authority? Actually, yes, I am those things. But I, I, I don't think we should stop at authority. Questioning is actually a fundamental tenet of my lifetime. It's the driver behind almost everything I have said and done in my career. It is what I believe is the single most important thing that I have to teach, to pass on to other people. It's one of the most important things I think that you can learn. Questioning forces us to see past the obvious. It forces us to put things into new perspective. Uh, in fact, that's actually why I chose this particular design for my tattoo, uh, because this design is a little bit deceptive. It forces you to, to look at it differently, to see what's really there. And that's what questioning is all about. In fact, I have a few questions for you right now. By a show of hands, how many of you understand that simplicity is a goal of good design work? Yes? Quite a lot of you. Good. Second question. How many of you know that the best way to uncover problems in a design is to run usability tests? Not very many of you. <laughs> OK. That surprises me. How many of you know that to be consistently successful as a designer, you have to have a repeatable process? A process that you can do over and over again to keep producing successful results. Yeah? All right. Now, finally, for those of you that raised your hands, how do you know that these things are true? I think we know that these things are true because experts have been telling us for years that they're true. They've advocated these ideas to us, and we've internalized them in various ways, and then we have, uh, in turn, uh, passed these ideas along to our clients, to our, our fellow designers. In fact, I'm betting if, if there are consultants in the audience, some of you have actually probably made a lot of money preaching these very ideas. Um, but those people that told us that these things are true, were they right? And if they were right, is there just one version of right? Is the truth as they see it the whole truth? I don't think it is. The truth very often is incomplete. In fact, many of the things that we accept as truth are obstacles to the truth. And accepting these ideas as the whole truth prevents us from finding the whole truth. It doesn't help us do better. It prevents us from doing better. It doesn't help us become better designers. It doesn't help us do the best that we can for our users. And it doesn't help us push our profession forward. Questioning what we know helps us find better answers. And I believe that one of the best and most crucial times to ask questions, the tough questions, is when we think we already know the answers. Now, to demonstrate this, I want to talk about the three questions that I just asked you. First, the question of simplicity. We've all been told for years that simplicity is a goal of design work. Everything must be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Designers, including myself, very often throw, throw around that Einstein quote. We try to, to get things down to their very core, to make things as simple as we can. Um, but Donald Norman was skeptical of this idea. Donald Norman, of course, the business partner of Mr. Jacob Nielsen. And he decided to, to, to look at what simplicity really means. 
And in fact, I saw him speak recently, and he said he likes to question the obvious. And this really resonated with me. Um, he said that when he looked at the idea of simplicity as a design goal, things weren't actually as simple as they appeared. Now, and basically, a lot of things that appeared simple were, in fact, not that simple at all. Uh, the Apple homepage, for example. Um, for several years, the Apple homepage has featured one very large entry point. Um, on that page, you know, it's, it's usually some very large image promoting the next version of the operating system, an iPad, an iPhone, something like that. Um, but is that page really as simple as it appears? It's really not. The Apple homepage is, in fact, uh, the entryway to a couple of dozen different points in the Apple website. There are sections to uh, reseller information, search results, uh, press releases, different sections of the site, such as the, the product store, the hardware store. Um, in all, on the, the Apple homepage right now, there are 28 different ways to enter the site. But there's just one that Apple is betting that you want to know about the most. And there's just one that Apple wants you to focus on the most. And because of that, they make it the main feature of the page. Now, Don Norman, in an article about this notion of challenging simplicity, uh, mentioned, uh, described a, a washing machine that he saw in South Korea that was supposed to be better than all the others, but it actually had more controls than the others. And when he started thinking about this, he, he realized that a lot of people actually don't buy things that are simpler because they think that they do less. When things appear simpler, we think that they do less. So in the end, we buy the, the thing that we believe does more. We all do this. Um, people make their purchasing decisions in part based on product uh, and, uh, feature lists. And Don actually says, features win over simplicity even when people realize that it is accompanied by more complexity. Now, by questioning the notion of simplicity as a design goal, Don Norman shows us that, in fact, we've been focusing on the wrong thing. Apple didn't make their homepage simpler. The South Koreans didn't make their washing machine simpler. Simplicity was not the goal. Simplicity is not what made it effective. Clarity is what made it effective. It's not simpler. It's clearer. And I think that is the main takeaway from challenging the notion of simplicity as a design goal. Now, next, I asked how many of you uh, understand or know that usability testing is a great way to uncover problems in a design. Some of you raised your hands. Not that many of you. I'm kind of wondering why that is. But, uh, so like the last question, this is actually sort of a trick question, because usability testing is, in fact, a great way to uncover problems in a design. It's just not quite in the way that you would think. Um, in the late 90s, Rolf Mullock, another associate of, of Mr. Jacob Nielsen, decided to establish a set of best practices for usability tests. And to do this, he, he created a series of comparative usability evaluations, CUEs. And he hired multiple teams for each of these evaluations to evaluate a single design and then report back their results. And what Rolf got back was really surprising. Um, for example, it turns, out, uh, it turns out that when different teams look at the same design, they actually see very different things. Rolf hired uh, nine different usability teams to evaluate Hotmail.com in one of these uh, rounds. And of the several hundred problems that these nine teams came back with, a very small percentage of them were reported by more than half of the teams. So not all nine teams found the same problem. Um, much worse than that, most of the things that these teams called serious or critical issues, these are the showstopper things that mean we shouldn't be putting this stuff out into the world, were reported just once. 
by one of the teams. The same thing happened when he hired 17 teams to evaluate a hotel reservation system called iHotel Gear. Now, usability testing is great for a lot of things. It is great for validating new design ideas. It is great for feeding a designer's instincts. There is no better way to learn how people work than to actually watch them work. It's as simple as that. It's also great for helping people on this side of the screen understand the people on the other side. What it's not great for is finding problems in an existing design to determine what you should focus on, what you should fix. It's actually kind of terrible at that. So by questioning what usability testing is, is good for, Rolf Mullock was able to, to, to show us how and when to use this invaluable tool in the best way possible. He said, don't use it to test new ideas. Use it to, or uh, excuse me, use it to test new ideas. Don't use it to test old ones. If you're using usability tests for this purpose, um, you would actually save quite a bit of money by having a loan reviewer do the evaluation because what he finds is going to be no better or worse. So finally, I asked how many of you know that to be consistently successful as a designer, you have to have a repeatable process. Some of you raised your hand to that as well. Jared Spool decided to uh, take a look at this question once. He decided to, to find out what the best web teams had in common and what the worst teams had in common. And what he found, also pretty surprising, he found that the best teams actually don't have a repeatable process. The ones that were having the most provable success, most consistently, had no process. They had a bunch of tools and tricks and techniques, as Jared calls them. And on any given project, they would hand pick the, the tools that they were going to use to solve the problem that, th that they faced, and then they improvised. What did the worst teams have in common? They all lived and died by these processes. This is step one, this is step two. And they consistently put out mediocre or failing work. So Jared found that despite that so many designers advocate for a strong process, process may actually be working against you. Now, Rolf and Don and Jared questioned things that we have all accepted as fact and came away with the discovery that things are not quite as clear as they have seemed. They basically walked right up to the sacred cows of our profession, and they tipped them over. Now, this is the kind of thinking that makes us better designers. This is the kind of thinking that helps us do our best for our users. And this is the kind of thinking that helps us push our industry, our profession, forward. In the end, it doesn't matter what anyone says about how to become a better designer or what techniques you should or shouldn't use or what user experience really means. What matters is that you ask those questions yourself and you keep pushing what we do beyond where we thought it could go. Brilliant insights are not the result of conventional thinking. Mind-blowing work is not the result of standardized rote processes. And you will never do the best work of your life doing exactly what everyone else is doing. What will make you better is asking those questions. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask why. Ask for justifications for decisions. Ask for validation. I want you to ask for evidence. Ask people to demonstrate that, that their ideas are good. Ask if there's a better way. Question the people who get up here today. Ask them to justify what they say and demonstrate that it's good. Ask your clients to validate their, their, their ideas. Ask your fellow designers. Ask yourself to justify your decisions to make sure that they're good, to show evidence that, that you're heading in the right direction. When something is considered standard, ask if there's a better way to do it. When a client says that they need you to add a feature, don't ask them how, ask them why. First question always needs to be why. 
question, question the status quo, question the standards, question the rules, question the processes, question your own designs, question your clients, question yourselves. Question, or ask the questions, and then question the answers. Stop being good enough, and start being great. Grazie.